Hey everybody, it's Party Elite, and today we're taking a look at common and sometimes quite surprising mistakes in Victoria 3 that might be hampering your successes. Naturally, these are speaking in broad strokes, and you might be pursuing a goal that is diametrically opposed to some of these tips just because you're trying something specific, so keep that in mind as we dive in. This is going to be a rapid-fire series of pointers covering all manner of topics, but for more in-depth guides, check out the playlist I've linked in the pinned comment below. Now, with no more time to waste and with timestamps included as always, let's begin. Producing Staples Unless you're playing an isolated nation or want to build an entirely self-sufficient nation or are pursuing an economy focused on producing staple goods for some reason, you should minimize the construction and upgrading of buildings that produce these staple goods. Construction takes time and money, and you don't want to waste either on making buildings you'll want to abandon as you industrialize anyway, and beyond that, if you're keeping the price of staples down to keep your pops happy and with a growing standard of living, it makes these businesses barely profitable, hurting the wages they'd be willing to pay. You're better off importing staples, preferably via land routes. Simply let other nations provide your people with things like food and meat while using tariffs to generate national revenue as well. Later, you can even create a customs union with or subjugate nations to provide these staples for your market. Your focus should instead be on industrializing your nation to produce more valuable goods that help bolster the economy and GDP and set yourself up for long-term success as an industrial powerhouse. Start with the acquisition of timber and fabric followed by steel and tools, all in order to keep future construction materials cheap, considering, again, construction is the baseline requirement for development in any direction. Then, you can see where the winds take you. Paying for construction. In this economy, not a chance. Remember that investment pools are available if your economic policy is interventionism, agrarianism, or laissez-faire. Under these policies, business owners that fall under the appropriate pop type will put a portion of their positive weekly balance into a pool of money that can be used to build specific buildings as determined by the economic policy. If you're planning on building any of these, you should first wait for the investment pool to accumulate if there's no rush. Feel free to build anything that the investment pool wouldn't cover, as you'll have to pay for those either way, but if you're about to build something that the investment pool would cover, again, if you're not in a rush, make sure they have enough money to do so first so they cover your expenses, allowing you to use your money elsewhere. Stagnating Tax Policies Many nations start with a massive peasant population, and they are a significant source of tax income if you have land-based taxation and a lot of unused arable land for these peasants to exist off of. Eventually, as you reduce the amount of these unused arable land slots and the associated subsistence farms, you'll no longer have enough peasants to make land-based taxation viable, as land tax only applies to peasants, not to be paid by any other pop type. So, make sure you're moving towards per capita taxation as this balance is tipped, as the reliance on land tax is significantly reduced, replaced by per capita tax that applies to all non-peasant pops instead. This should make you a significant amount of money as you industrialize and modernize without needing to increase your tax settings outside of desperate circumstances. And, if you are in desperate circumstances, try to avoid resorting to consumption taxes on staple goods. This can lead to instability. Instead, prioritize luxury clothes, luxury furniture, liquor, and tobacco as targets for consumption tax as a great source of extra income that doesn't hurt the lower strata of society that is typically always suffering and more likely to have rebellions. Swaying first. It might be tempting to get other nations on your side as soon as possible during a diplomatic play, but you should keep in mind that swaying nations costs maneuver, and nations that have already been swayed to one side can still be swayed back to the other, and any maneuvers that were used by the first nation to sway will not be refunded. At times, you might be better off waiting to sway until the last possible moment to avoid this predicament and to put your opponent in said position instead. You also might find the nations remain completely unswayed by either side, and if you don't need them on your side after all, you can save yourself some trouble in the form of additional war goals and infamy. Abandoning Markets At times, you'll start as a junior member in a customs union, and it might be tempting to abandon it and break free of your shackles as soon as possible. You might be upset at not being the market leader, or at having a smaller part of the market share. Don't let these bother you. Abandoning your customs union means you'll separate into your own market, and only the goods you produce in your own nation will be readily available to your people and businesses, and the sudden reduction in goods quantities 
will result in skyrocketing prices, plunging both businesses and people alike into destitution. You need to establish trade partners to counter that, but trade routes cost bureaucracy without trade agreements as well as convoys, which is putting an unnecessary strain on your nation early on. Take your time to prepare before leaving a customs union, and make sure you've set yourself up for stability before doing so. Rushing production methods Adjusting production methods is a great way to get more out of a building, but don't completely abandon the lower tier and supposedly worse production methods entirely. In times of war or goods shortages, you might find some of the higher tier production methods to be unsustainable due to the cost of input goods and your inability to reduce said costs. At such times, rather than leaving a business to die or instead of using subsidies to keep the business afloat, you might be better off temporarily changing their production methods. The same holds true if the business isn't able to find enough employees of the type needed by higher level production methods. This will keep the business alive, paying wages, sustaining your economy. Ignoring the economy of scale Almost all buildings will increase their throughput at higher levels. Take advantage of this. Even though it may seem marginal at first, it scales up very nicely. Investigate states to see if they provide any bonuses to throughput and build buildings accordingly for an extra boost you can't get anywhere else. And don't hesitate to use decrees that boost the appropriate throughput as well. This applies for a great variety of building types, including government administration buildings that supply bureaucracy and gold mines that supply minting for your national economy and increased throughput means a building is making more money for every pound it spends, leaving everybody a little bit richer and with a little bit more money to tax. When leveling buildings up to take advantage of increased throughput, make sure you don't go beyond the infrastructure limitations of the state as it will start to hurt market access and the price of goods going into and out of the state in question will skyrocket or otherwise shift. Make sure to build railroads and use decrees to stay on top of infrastructure before it starts causing you trouble. Ignoring Lenses and Decrees I have to say, I find the lens system a little clunky and uninviting. Unfortunately, it hides behind it some very powerful tools that become very easy to miss because of that uninviting nature. The production lens lets you quickly see which of your states provides what goods and contributions to your GDP, and it also lets you see what the GDP and production of foreign states are if you want to plan your conquests accordingly. Flipping through the tabs, you can also get a quick read on exactly what buildings you're able to build in case you're trying to figure out what production chains you have the option to tap into. The political lens has a few building options as well, and a couple state options if you want to find unincorporated states quickly, or if you want to move your capital. But perhaps most importantly, you can find the extremely powerful decrees here. Read through these thoroughly, and make sure to use them as they can make quite a difference across a variety of factors. Improved infrastructure and construction speed, reduced penalties from turmoil, increased welfare payments to keep POPs afloat, improved education access and qualifications to help POPs switch from type to type, promote national values to help POPs convert faith and culture, saving them from discrimination that causes radicalization, lower pay, and more problems beside. Encouraging industries will boost throughput as discussed earlier, while greener grass campaigns will help with migration to a state that you want to populate for development. Meanwhile, Enlistment efforts will speed up how quickly conscripts form up, while also increasing the rate at which barracks are able to bring battalions up to full strength after they've taken damage. This can make a huge difference in a prolonged war. The political lens also lets you quickly see the spread of political strength across interest groups in both your own and enemy territory, again, helping you plan your conquests. The diplomatic lens gives you a quick idea of diplomatic relations as well as diplomatic actions and plays you can make while also allowing you to declare interests and establish colonies, pointing out exactly where these opportunities lie. The military lens lets you quickly see how your battalions and flotillas are spread out, where you might want to recruit more, and where you might need more generals and admirals to take charge of the troops. It also lets you quickly perform these actions as well as activate conscription centers during war or build barracks. Finally, the trade lens lets you get a quick summary of your imports and exports per market and it gives you easy access to viewing market details of foreign markets. You can use this lens to build construction sectors, and you can use it to move your market capital or see exactly what goods you're able to import or export beyond what's already in your market. Rushing the wrong tech. There are lots of technologies to choose from in Victoria 3, but a few are almost essential starters regardless of your playthrough. Urban planning allows you to enable construction centers to work with their second level production method, providing a huge boost to construction rates in your nation, allowing you to develop much more quickly. 
The atmospheric engine is a must-have sooner rather than later for any economy that intends to rely heavily on mining, while intensive agriculture is great to get if you've got more of an agrarian economy for starters, and it's a prerequisite for a lot of later techs you'll need anyway. Don't try to get too far down a tech tree too quickly either. Take advantage of tech spread, where other technologies come to you over time without you needing to actively research them. This is more likely to happen at lower tech levels as the spread is from technologies researched by other nations that you don't have yet. So if you end up catching up or getting ahead too quickly, you might leave a lot of free progress on the table. Don't forget to build universities to bolster research rates and literacy, which then further helps bolster research rates even more. Ignoring your navy. If your armies are ever outgunned, outnumbered, or outmatched, there is one last hope in causing morale damage to the enemy. While slaughtering the enemy on the battlefield is a quick way to guarantee victory, destroying their will to fight is an equally viable, if not slightly more challenging, option to execute. Morale drops on a per-battalion basis when in combat, and when it gets low enough, the battalion flees the battle. If it starts extremely low, the battalion in question will be quicker to cross that threshold and flee. Morale in Victoria 3 is limited by the general's access to supply. This means if a general is not able to keep their supply up, the maximum their soldiers' morale can ever be is the same as their supply. When fighting overseas, a general relies on shipping lanes and convoys to maintain their supply. If you're able to use the raid convoy's action on the shipping lanes they use, the damage caused over time will eventually whittle down their supply, minimizing their maximum morale. If you're able to pull it off, even technologically superior enemies can be brought to their knees. Apart from this, raiding convoys will also allow you to cut off the supply of goods to your enemy. Depending on what goods are being traded along the raided shipping lane, damage you cause can result in a significant goods shortage for their military buildings, hurting their military capabilities, or you can cause goods shortages for various pop and building needs. This can cause massive radicalization among pops whose needs become too expensive due to market shortages, and it can cause buildings to suffer from increased input good costs, reducing their profitability, potentially tanking the nation's GDP if the damage is significant and prolonged enough. I hope this video helps you get ahead in your Victoria 3 games, and if you have any thoughts of your own you'd like to add, feel free to drop them in the comments down below. Don't forget to check the rest of the Beginner's Guide playlist out for more in-depth coverage of topics, and if you want more Victoria 3 guides, let's plays, and more, don't hesitate to subscribe. As always, a massive thanks goes out to all of the channel members and patrons who've been supporting the channel on a monthly basis. Y'all keep us alive and running smoothly. And of course, a big ol' thanks goes out to each and every one of you for watching. Until next time, cheers.